Welcome everyone to Hip Hop and Women's Voices in the Middle East and North Africa with Dr. Angela Williams. Dr. Angela Williams is Associate Director at the Center for South Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She researches and teaches about educational policy studies and international education particularly as related to women, art, and representation. Her book, Hip Hop Harem, explores the work of seven female rap artists from the Middle East and North Africa, and the impact of their music upon the experiences of women in the region. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you all so much uh, for, for being here and um, yeah, for inviting me uh, to this series. It's such a huge honor and a pleasure um, to talk with teachers. I understand most of you, many of you are teachers or students or lifelong learners. Um, and it's just so meaningful and worthwhile for me to, to speak with you all today. Um, when I was doing my studies on the region and um, in education, I wanted to write curriculum for teachers, but I've never been a classroom teacher myself. And I felt like, you know, what do I have to say? How am I gonna, what can I tell people? Um, so I, I thought, I decided that whatever research, whatever writing I did, you know, I wanted it to still be able to contribute to educators' lives. Um, so I don't know, you know, and so much did that in the dissertation, but a lot of that dissertation uh, research is here that I'm going to present to you today. So it's just uh, hugely uh, meaningful to me. So thank you for being here and inviting me. Um, looking forward to our discussions um, and just thank you for all that you've done this year. If you've taught online or again, been a student, we've had such a difficult year um, and still many difficulties uh, continuing, you know, but I think we can find hope in the arts. I think the arts um, provide a space for not only like voicing our experiences, but allowing us as people to have integrity too, because we get to, we get to say what, you know, what's going on, you know, um, we have the mic or the, the paintbrush or, or, or whatever it may be. So I think art is so powerful. And that idea sort of is what influenced me to, to start looking at hip hop and women's voices. I'm not, a, you know, I wouldn't consider myself a huge hip hop head or fan, um, but I, I, I actually saw rap music in concerts when I was in Egypt about 16 years ago for the first time I studied in Egypt, um, was my first time in Egypt. And I, I saw concerts, uh, hip hop concerts, I saw opera. And then when I came back to the States and started continuing, you know, courses in Middle East studies, I just, I didn't see that, you know, I didn't see um, the complexities, the creativity of people's lives um, being represented that much, uh, especially women, you know. Um, so that's what influenced, um, you know, what I decided to look at and work on. Also, who has seen uh, Straight Outta Compton? Has anyone seen that movie? Yes, you've got, yes, a, yes. A, yes absolutely. Many yeses, absolutely great. That, all, that film also influenced what, what I want to write about. When I saw it, um, so, you know, I can't remember which artist it was exactly, Dr. Dre or Ice Cube, um, saying that, you know, they were changing the game, that they were changing the music uh, by doing reality raps. They were rapping, writing about uh, what's going on in their everyday lives with uh, violence, of police harassment, um, just different activities related to gangs and their lives. That they were living through, you know, these weren't things they were just making up. Um, they're reality raps. So I thought, I started to think about, you know, uh, rap music in that way. Um, and I saw these women doing the same thing. Like they were taking up that idea of, we're going to rap about our lived experiences. Um, that's what we're writing about and rapping about. And they're so serious. Uh, and as artists, they consider themselves rappers, um, whether or not they're you know, totally making a living off of it or not, but they consider themselves uh, to be rappers. And I just uh, really respected that. And I thought we can, we can learn from them. You know, why not thinking about the, this um, form, art form, this music as like a source of knowledge production. Um, so I feel like today I started writing this back in 2016, I think. Um, so 
and that was um, a lot of the, we started, you know, the, how was the days of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and Sandra Bland and uh, the summer I was writing Philando Castile, his death happened. Um, so I was seeing this on the news um, and it really impacted me. And so I, I tried to use writing as an, a channel outlet and thinking about how do we value live black lives, you know, um, not just what's created, their art that's created. And, you know, people around the world are listening to hip hop. It's one of the highest selling genres of music around the world. Um, and artists around the world are taking this up and really identifying with the culture. Um, so I was just, I thought like, how, how, how can that be? But here at home, you know, this is still happening to us. So I guess I wanna challenge us. Like, first of all, like whenever we think about hip hop in another context, like we like to think about its origins and maybe always teach a little bit about that. And I'm gonna have some resources I'll show you in here um, that, you could, that you could read or even have students read. Um, just to start to like value the artists' lives and their own biographies and what, you know, what they've come from. Also, I think thinking about hip hop and women's uh, representation is, again, all the more relevant still today as a way to like combat this idea of exceptionalism or exoticism of the region or just others in general, people's lives that aren't like our own or, um, you know, we think we can point and say, this is how they are, you know, like this. Even, even me, I had to struggle with this in writing about women in hip hop. I wanted to really take each artist as an individual. And that's what I, I did. And I'll show you again as well, some vignettes. I wanted each one to be shown on like her own individuality, um, rather than saying like, all oh, women from this region who are rappers are act like this, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, th this is a way, <laughs> hopefully, of combating this idea of the region is exceptional, is so different, or it's so something. And I thought perhaps a way you could even introduce this into your class is, um, is just think about asking students, you know, have you ever been misunderstood because of what you look like, or as what you identify as, or your family background, or something that you've been categorized as? And have you felt that characteristic has been false? You know, and then just asking them, think about what was the claim that was made about you and why, why was that upsetting? So I guess my question to, to you would be, what would, if you want to throw in the chat, what would be some of those identities that maybe your students would have that they would think, um, I, I'm always misunderstood because of this. Um, Jessica was already commenting that um, before you post your question, Dr. Williams, that they were talking in her class about uh, Chimamanda Adichie's danger of a single story. Um, here's, here's a response for you or a thought. Gender identity, my transgender students, especially LGBTQ identity comes up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, rural, rural students um, are thought to be quote unquote dumb or backward. Quiet students are also misassumed to be so. Yeah. Um, SES immigration status. I, I appreciate both of those. Actually, I'm from a rural uh, background myself. Um, so yeah, I very much appreciate that. Um, yeah. yeah. Immigration. There we go. People, again, international students, especially from Asia at the school, many students who are Asian are assumed to be smart automatically. Um, a lot about race and socioeconomic status. Some students are misidentified as, as Chinese, Hmong students, for example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So to me, thank you for sharing all that. And yeah, I just want everybody too also to feel comfortable to share whatever during this space. It's time, it's a safe space. And um, I think oftentimes, you know, in education or talking or academia or whatever, you know, we have to, we feel like we have to say the right things always or, so just feel free to share whatever is um, like your experiences and your students' experiences. Um, so sometimes I, I just thought, yeah, maybe if we're, introducing a new area of the world or a new region that's totally different to them, um, how to make it similar, you know, right? Just by saying, um, perhaps, you know, there's misrepresentation of this region, um, but you know what that feels like, you know, or maybe, you know, you've probably had that similar experience. And if it's wrong for you, or if you know it's um, wrong, there, there might be other misunderstandings out there, right? So 
you could even yeah task the student hey you know this semester we're going to be um like it's our job to help correct those misunderstandings you know kind of something like that to help them take ownership of of like the study even themselves um and like yeah acknowledging their own not knowledge and experiences in that way also just yeah centering knowledge on women's voices and experiences and i'll talk a little more about this too later but um mainly what i'm saying here is that all a lot of what we know about the middle east region and teach about the region um is based on work and writing from people not even from the region you know um and that's that's really bothersome to me i was just trying to design an intro to middle east studies class for the past couple of years i've been working on it and finally i think we'll be teaching it this uh summer online but i really wanted to look use scholarship uh of people from the region um sometimes that's tricky yeah yet for me then i feel most comfortable reading english scholarship so i'd have to find that um but there's so many scholars here in the US and Europe abroad who are from the region writing in English. Um, and so, so right, just I wanted to center that what we're teaching about the region on people from the region, also specifically women's voices. So for the rest of this, uh, the presentation, I wanna just give a brief overview and rationale for my study, what I did, and then I'll introduce to you some examples that I think could be useful for teaching with um, these songs and with these artists. And then we'll listen to some music and have talk a little bit about a few songs and then open it up for more discussion. If you have a burning question, maybe put it in though before, but I, I aim to that we'll get to open discussion. That's, that's the point. Um, I wanna talk about, yeah, my ration, like the rationale, because I think that and like my methodology, I think it's so important again to always question how we know what we know about the region and like why we're saying that and how many people did you talk to or what sources, you know, so that's why it's so important. Um, also, okay, these look, these few examples are to give you sort of ammunition if anyone ever asks you why are you teaching about hip hop. <laughs> and that's so that uh, that's because we're using hip hop, considering it as an art, a post colonial art. And we're thinking about art as, again, a site of knowledge production, especially when we're looking at the artist's biographies and saying, OK, she went through this um, immigration experience. That's why she's you know, writing about this, feeling like she's in exile. And this is something really meaningful to her. Um, and there's yeah, been work done on post-colonial aesthetics and pe critical pedagogy, as well on, again, artists' biographies and their influences within global art. And also, I'm just thinking of popular culture as a site of knowledge production that affects people's lives and understandings of themselves. And these are two works, uh, um, Jillian Baez, who worked on the Latina body, and Aisha Durham, um, who worked on uh, Black womanhood, and just how in popular culture texts, actually, Aisha Durham was more in hip hop and um, its commentary on uh, women and how that may affect how women think of themselves or even talk, talk about other women. So that's just to say that popular culture does affect our lives in a real way, um, uh, in the way that we think about ourselves and think, and think of others as well. And again, centering on the voices of girls and women. And for that, I'm drawing on the work of uh, our very own Dr. Ruth Nicole Brown from Illinois and her work on uh, Black girlhood. So let's think a little bit more about knowledge creation. These are various maps of the Middle East region um, and an Orientalist painting um, up there of women, or, or, or perhaps so a harem is called the pink flamingo. So tell me some primary sources that you're using or you have used. Uh, Deb says street art, graffiti from the Arab uprising and historical documents, artwork, political right. cartoons and maps, mm -hmm. letters, diaries, political cartoons, the writings of Ibn Battuta in a world history class. There's also the distant view of a minaret and other stories by Alifa Rifat, music and dance from people of origin, poetry, lots of great sources here, lots of good stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much. So it's not too, uh, you know, out of the way to suggest art as a primary source. You've all are already said that poetry and graffiti, street art and graffiti. I love that. So um, 
that's all, that's wonderful. Um, again, just pointing to a lot of the knowledge, early knowledge from European travel logs, you know, is what was taken as knowledge. Um, so nowadays we don't we don't need to take secondhand uh, um, experiences, but we can look, yeah, at, at primary sources, and art is one of them. So great, thank you. So just just a little bit on hip hop, if you haven't, or if you teach on hip hop, you probably have uh, read the work of Dr. Tricia Rose. She's a U.S. scholar and her seminal work, 1994 Black Noise, uh, really outlines, outlines, excuse me, so beautifully um, toward the advent of rap music and hip hop culture coming from displacement and urbanization uh, within cities and industrialization. Um, within that industrialization, people's, yeah, had, had to, houses were um, destroyed and had to live in, you know, smaller um, living quarters and uh, apartments. That's when, um, like, high, yeah, the, the high-rise apartments or more apartments uh, and, and um, became more prevalent, like, in, in cities. So, um, Oh, sorry. Her second work also is really influential. Oh, I wanted to say too about rap. I mean, I am can I consider hip hop to be all inclusive, like of like the culture, um, including the elements of hip hop, uh, rapping, um, or in seeing DJing, or you know, in the back in the day it was you know turning the tables. Now it's more electronic electronic music, um, art, like graffiti art. Um, Fashion could be an element and uh, knowledge um, of what you're bringing. You know what what you're bringing in your in your in your lyrics and in the music that you're creating. Um, so when I say hip hop, I'm considering all of that. Um, so her second book as well is really informative. It talks about the commercialization of hip hop, which has occurred since the '90s. Um, and she argues is really overwhelmingly violent and misogynistic and harmful to black people in the US. She lays out, which was uh, so informative to me, how um, radio stations you know, will have agreements with certain labels to play certain artists and certain songs. That's why we never hear our um, beloved underground uh, or independent artists a lot of times on, on mainstream big radio stations. Um, but, and she, she maintains in her 1994 book that hip hop is a site of knowledge production and dissemination. Um, so I think it's a really accessible book for students starting at high school to read. Um, a little bit about hip hop in the Middle East and North Africa region. In the past, I'd, yeah, 15 years, there have been a lot, several documentary films. So you may have heard of these. Have people heard of Slingshot Hip Hop? 2008. You hear that? Yes, some people are saying it. yes already. Yes. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yes, yeah. I love hip hop in Morocco. Um, that we was love awesome. it. yeah, centered around a, a festival. Okay, awesome. So have people seen Sonita? This is um, she's an artist from Afghanistan. Was a refugee in Iran. Um, yes, someone yeah. says Deb. She played it for her students last week. Great, that's great. Excellent. Yes. Um, so there's also some, yeah, there's writing and scholarship around that too. I just wanted to point out and acknowledge um, David McDonald that is at Uni Indiana University, excuse me, and Ted Swedenberg at the University of Arkansas have written on Palestinian artists. Um, Zakia Salim at Rutgers has written on Moroccan hip hop. Um, there's been a recent book by Nahid Siamdous on, and it's titled Soundtracks of a Revolution. It's music in Iran, popular music in general in Iran. And it's again, very inclusive, expansive. Um, Egyptian hip hop, I wrote an article on uh, English and Arabic code switching in hip hop and sort of the localization, how hip hop is, was becoming more localized back 11 years ago. And I would just like to say one change I've seen since when I started um, observing, you know, hip hop in the region is that in the beginning, I feel like, 10, 11 years ago, it was more um, uh, of an elitist kind of uh, practice, perhaps. Uh, artists oftentimes spoke English well or fluently. And to me, that single signals, you know, if you're if you're from the region and you speak so and you speak very fluently, means that um, 
you've been exposed to the language uh, since you were small, probably. Um, and that could have been maybe a, a private school, an, uh, a European school or, or American school. Um, and yeah, the vast majority of many people can, cannot afford that. So today I, I see a lot more artists wrapping in their colloquial variety. So the Egyptian artists that I look at, looked at, they are wrapping in Egyptian, like all of it. They're not even trying to throw in the English words to be like, I'm authentic, I'm, you know, to sound like I whatever, international or something. No, they're just totally in Egyptian. And they're just like so proud of just wrapping all in Egypt, Egyptian Arabic. Um, so that's kind of one change I've seen just in, in this genre of music um, recently, like, yeah, within the, again, the past decade. But do check out some of the other um, scholarship. There's always people are, new people writing on uh, hip hop, less so in the MENA region, but it's, yeah, it's growing, I think. So in my study, what I was really interested in, how are women, these seven artists I looked at, how are they appropriating hip hop culture and fashioning it to fit their needs in their home societies? Like what's meaningful to them? What do they need? And what are the issues that the artists take up in their lyrics and videos? And what do other women from the region think about these messages, right? So I was really interested in how popular culture translate onto like lived experience, vice versa, that, that exchange between lived experience and popular culture. Um, so what I did was, this is methodology in two parts, is that it? Okay, part one. The methodology is called discourse ethnography and it's tracing meaning or discourse discussion about a topic, in my case, being a girl, being a woman in a particular country, tracing this across texts, text meaning like music or uh, online communication, uh, verbal, like talking conversation. So first I looked at the, the production, like the artist, the song, and I found these songs on a couple of websites. Most of them were on this revolutionary Arab rap, female rappers blog. Um, and they were over 90, maybe almost hundred uh, artists listed there. And that was, um, I believe that the, the, the name of the blogger was Sean O'Keefe. He was a graduate student at the time he put the blog up. I don't know where he is today or what's, what's going on with that. But to my gratitude, it was up there in 2016 when I was looking for, for artists. It just was, you know, and it had like Justina, it had Iranian artists on there as well. It wasn't just Arab artists. And then there's this neat website called Mideast Tunes that have, have a lot of um, independent artists, all genres, like all the genres that you guys put at the beginning are on there. And I, I really recommend um, that website. I think it's based in Bahrain or out of Bahrain perhaps, uh, but I really appreciate that as well. I think I came up with one or two artists from that. And I chose artists who specifically had songs about uh, being a woman, woman girlhood, um, something like that. So it was a really purposeful uh, choice. And I looked at their songs and had the lyrics translated. I, you know, I can understand and speak some Egyptian Arabic, but I use native speakers to help me, uh, especially with the Iranian artists. And most of the songs were on YouTube. And I'd also, um, you know, made some vignettes profiles about them. And I read a lot of online articles, many, a lot in English. Some, like in, there was a Sudanese website that wrote about one artist. Um, there were a lot of YouTube, uh, interviews too, as well, or talk show hosts, talk shows, excuse me, in Egypt, um, with the artists. And I, you know, would listen to those. And then for the next part, oops, sorry. If that was my art audience reception part to see how the music, um, impacts listeners, how they make sense of it. Are they, do they agree? Does it reinforce how they feel about something? So I interviewed women about their views and opinions on the lyrics and the rappers um, and asking, do these lyrics reflect your experience? Does this remind you of something you've ever encountered before? Um, and it was a small group. I talked to eight women who all had something to do with higher education. Many of them I'd known for uh, over several years. So they felt comfortable talking to me about these uh, issues. And this is just a list of the artists and songs that I specifically focused on. So 
um, I'll just, yeah. Um, you can see that they're pretty um, much having to do with, again, old oh, woman. The Kufiyeh's Arab, this was, you know, one that was very much uh, Arab uh, identity, uh, pride. Um, Egyptian girl was another one kind of about uh, proud pride and, and patriotism, patriotism. But the rest were pretty a lot, you know, about having to do with a woman, voice of woman. Um, like I'm not a cigarette free woman, femininity uh, free woman, rap girl. Um, I wish the world gave me a daughter. And here is I wanted to include this map because it's their I call it the global reach. So even though that's where this region is where they're from. These are all the places that they all have traveled to, you know. Um, so even though they're from the re they they've traveled to every continent uh, almost you know, um, for uh, concerts. My findings, what I after listening to you know looking at lyrics, talking to other women, I saw themes of liberation. Two big themes that are that arose one of liberation from legal and social codes that restrict women's social behavior and fail to protect women from abuse. So artists were talking about um, how is my every move, you know, regulated, but if someone, uh, if, if I'm groped in the street or something, I can't go to the police station and file a case. Like, so they wanted freedom from those, from codes or laws that don't protect them, that just are restrictive to them. Um, and also agency in their, her own appearance and socialization and professional choices. Um, oftentimes they talk about physical dress. They may talk about hair or wearing a scarf. Um, not, uh, and it's, it's a commentary. What I say is that they're very, um, these artists are very conscious of this pressure um, and they're using the music to, to speak back to that, um, you know? And also I saw agency in their appearances just over time change. Um, some artists were wearing scarves, but then a few couple years later, they wouldn't wear the scarf and they wouldn't, and I, I saw those that took it off, you know, wouldn't, weren't making comments on, you know, why they took it off or not, but just to show this fluidity or um right ability for for women to to decide on you know on her parents and parents and also to change um that i thought was very um to, to me was very impactful because it shows that women um to me that women, women make choices that are best suited to them at a particular time um that's what that's kind of what i took away from what they were showing um as yeah a, yeah I'm sorry. Uh -huh. No, one of your one of the participants is already seeing um, comparisons with the Me Too movement in the U.S. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you because that's also the same time I started writing this. That started happening. Um, exactly. Yeah. And again, not. Yeah, I just want to say that the artists I felt like weren't championing one way or another of being a woman. But this is, they were just like, this is me now, you know, and then if you, now this is me. Um, yeah, when Maya Mahmoud first started rapping, she had, was wearing the scarf and she was, yeah, had brought a lot of attention to her for that purpose. Um, we'll see her later on. Um, so, okay, here are some learning exercises that I thought we could think about. This is called, this is a discourse ethnography project. And I've used this before um, when I, I te taught a class on women in popular culture. And I wanted students to try to do what I did like in this project. And I think, I think they do a pretty good job and I perhaps you can use it as well. But again, so discourse ethnography is thinking about how our discourse is traced across multiple texts. Um, so an artwork, I think, and then like a person's life. I think of those as different texts. So for an example, um, you could, again, the discourse could be girlhood, womanhood, gender, um, anything. Uh, and the assignment would be to pick an artwork for, for this purpose, it could be a song. You could ask students to choose a song um, and describe how 
the artist represents whatever it is you're talking about, gender, um, it could be environmental issue or it could be anything. Um, and then part two, oh, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't put part two. Part two then is to uh, find someone in real, like a real person in real life who has that artist similar background and have them look, listen to the song and ask them, you know, what do you think about this? How do you, um, does it resonate with you? Does this remind you of experiences you've had? Here's another example. I've also asked them, I've let, let students use um, paintings, uh, photography, um, poetry, spoken word. It could be any artwork and it's a way for them to yeah, analyze the art, first of all, and learn about the artist. I asked I ask them as well to um, research as much about the artist's biography as you can, and then find someone who is similar to that artist in some way. Like usually it's their, con back, their country of origin background. I think that's what I asked them and interview them about how they receive this. And it's been, I think students have really appreciated, I've seen students um, talk to their parents, you know, um, South Asian American students uh, who, who interviewed like a beauty blogger, a famous South Asian beauty blogger, or not interviewed her, but focused on her um, and then talked to her mother about her experience um, as an immigrant uh, woman. Um, or they talk to friends. I've had students say, you know, this is so I've had a best friend, a Palestinian best friend, like um, since grade school, and we've never talked about her being Palestinian. Or like I've never asked her about what like what it's really like to be a Muslim girl. Or um, so I, I feel like it's been like yeah a real neat learning experience. But students need to be open, and um, sometimes it pushes you outside of your comfort zone. And um, but so far I think they've kind of they've appreciated it. Uh, do you think this could be something useful to you all? Do you have students like do projects talking with other students in the school maybe? We are awaiting thoughts. Does it make sense? Okay. I didn't put the rest of the assignment. Definitely. We've got okay. some enthusiasm here. Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. Great. Another idea could be just to look at women's expression through poetry, writing, music within a local co country context. Um, and like the traditional expression of it and then comparing it to something modern today. That's something I would love to do and I just haven't had time to do it. And I wanna show you this book. Uh, this is a, a mirror, the mirror of my heart, a thousand years of Persian poetry by, by women. Uh, and that's introduced and translated by uh, Dick Davis. I don't know if you guys have heard of him or her. He's amazing in that he translates to English Persian poetry and maintains the rhyme. It's, it's really, it's really something. We had him here at Illinois for about a year too. So I got to hang out with him and know him a little bit, but um, I've always wanted to use some poetry, women's poetry, um, Persian and, and like compare it to their to today, uh, spoken word or hip hop. Um, and oftentimes, I think that women are writing about like their angst, you know, I feel that it's going to be <laughs> topics that could be parallel, you know, um, so that could be another. Have you has anyone heard of Dick Davis or have any ideas? Uh, we haven't had anyone say that just yet, but we, we have a lot of enthusiasm. Some people have taught translations of the Shahname. Um, someone would like to do something similar with the voice of Ibn Battuta or another primary source. Um, uh, I, some people have used protest music to explore the civil rights movement in South Africa and the US. So some fun, fantastic um, ideas and suggestions. That's great. That's great. Thank you. That was awesome. Song. Okay. And then, and another idea I was just thinking of is um, researching, having a song in this case, and then researching one of the issues in the song. Um, well, it sounds like you're, like you're using protest music in South Africa and looking at some of globally national international statistics so for instance so sonita our um rapper from afghanistan had a song on child marriage also imani yahya from yemen an artist i looked at also talked about had, an, had a song commenting on um 
young girls, you know, having having to be forced to be married. Um, so thinking about child marriage or slavery around the world uh, or sexual slavery around the world, there's I think there's an increased awareness about that around the world and even here in the US it happening. Um, so maybe perhaps if you were teaching about the region for a unit and this song could be introduced or a student could learn more about um, the issue in that song and then it internationally so that it's in a broader context that can be a, a bigger uh, issue, problem and, and global issue that's being dealt with. Um, and just seeing how that issue is depicted in art. Oh yeah, I was writing Sultana's, oh yeah, Sultana, the Moroccan artist Sultana has a song, Sotimisat, which we'll hear about um, uh, women being forced into sex work and also using perhaps Nawal and Sadawi's Women at Point Zero. I've, I've used that in a class as well, um, which is about a woman in prison who was in prison for um, killing a man who was forcing her to work in prostitution. Does that sound, does that sound um, reasonable? Any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of interest. So um, yeah. we have that song, Sonita's, uh, Sonita's on Child Marriage. Sounds like it will be a great companion when I teach A Thousand Splendid Sons. Mm -hmm. The plot is about child marriage. Right. Jessica wonders, do you have suggestions for how to utilize some of these with younger high schoolers, like ninth and 10th grade? Yes, I think we're going to look. Yeah, let's go to the songs. Let's look at my am. Because I have I've used her work for, I think, a summer upward bound class. So that's they're in, I think they're in high school upward bound. Yeah, they're younger. Um, and I'm going to play a song. Let's hear her song, because I think some of the issues that she sometimes brings up uh, or just women pressure on girls um, can be relatable. Thinking about just pressures that girls face. Um, I asked them to, yeah, look at the lyrics. Does something look familiar to you? Um, the thing, these songs mostly don't have profanity at all. Um, she is our first Egyptian artist from Egypt and she gained recognition back in 2013 as she was a finalist on this Arabs Got Talent competition, reality competition show. And at that time she was an 18 year old student majoring political science um, in BBC Arabic and various, oh no, I'm sorry, just BBC, regular BBC and The Guardian. Oh no, I believe it was The Guardian. She was covered, various international media covered her um, and she talked about how she went to audition for the show and her family very much encouraged her. In fact, it was her father who suggested she uh, try out. Her, her brother went to try out and he said, you know, you write as well. You write and um, rap or you write poetry. Um, why don't you do that? Try to go and do that. Um, she talked about writing in an early age, writing poetry, and then starting to put it to music and then realizing what I'm doing, you know, it's like I'm rapping. Um, and she said about her songs, I realized all the male rappers must have a track in which they talk about girls and their clothes, blaming girls for everything happening around us. That wasn't right. So I rapped about girls and the problems they face. And this is her song, Femininity. If you can, I, yeah, if you see the lyrics, I'll play it. Um, and perhaps Jessica, if you, if you think you asked that question, we can see if there would be anything in, um, in the lyrics of this song that you could give to younger students and just say, you know, asking what is the issue here that she's dealing with? What's the pressure that she's feeling? Um, perhaps let's here, I'll, I'm gonna, oh, I might have to stop sharing. So I um, showed that one to a high school summer program and um, asked the students about that. And some girls raised their hand and said, or I asked, you know, is there anything in there? What's she talking about? And they said, yeah, she's talking, you know, wearing makeup, having to uh, look a certain way. Um, they, you know, they resonated with it. Um, so was there, what, what other, yeah, I guess I would just ask, what issues um, is she 
talking about? And would do you think your students or younger students um, would be able to, um, you know, receive that or, or process or comment on that? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jamal says, yeah, this would go well when we read and watch Persepolis. Oh, yeah, Persepolis. Yeah. 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 Yeah, a great pairing of different kinds of texts. Dr. Right. I like that. Or you could, I, I'm going to have a Iranian artist called Justina. Um, you could use her as well. But yeah, Mayam's from each. Yeah. Do you talk about Persepolis in context of Iran or just uh, like literature? Good question. We'll see what Jamal says. Yeah. In the meantime, um, responding to your earlier question, issues like expectations for dress and makeup, that would certainly resonate for, for US students. And Jamal responds in the context of Iran, he teaches. Uh, okay. Yeah. And I would suggest like using Justina, maybe a song or two by her, um, where we'll get to her. But you're welcome to use Mayam as well to just show um, perhaps comparison across cultures. Again, I just, I, I, uh am real careful and concerned not to just think of like Muslim women woman again kind of thing and just um if you're talking about Persepolis in Iran perhaps look for a case in Iran you know what I'm saying like keep it keep the context unless you're able to do something com comparatively but just pointing out the differences like significancies of each case if that makes sense but Great, thanks for sharing that. Tell me what you think about Justine once we get to her. This is Sultana, she's from Morocco. Her real name is Yusra Aukef, born in 1986 and grew up in Casablanca. And she experienced hip hop first at the age of 13 years old as a B-girl or dancer while studying at American Language Center um, in Casablanca. And I, all this info, again, I got online um, from interviews they had done. She said she was influenced by Tupac and Aretha Franklin. And she began rapping in the all-female group Tigress Flow. And in 20, 2008, they won uh, an award at the Mawazine Music Festival. So this is, you know, a long, not too recent. I mean, it's 2008, just to let you know that she's been rapping a while, you know, in, in the industry. Uh, her music to her, she said, represents and lyrics represent what is real, such as mental and phys physical abuse that women endure on a daily basis by insults, by words, by media, by everything, she said. Um, and let's, this is her, her the voice of women. So what were, what did you hear expressed there? So we have some, we have some response. Ross says she was speaking to other women, seems to ask why are they in this relationship? Mm. I, it was interesting because I couldn't see I'll wait what until people pop up Dr. Williams I couldn't okay. see the lyrics but what I was struck by was by the forcefulness of her voice yes yeah thank you yes not only the lyrics but right the tone her, of voice yeah tone of voice and the physicality or right her gestures um and tone of voice uh, absolutely Curious. And, mm -hmm. and Jessica, thank you, Jessica says, it seems that Sultana is encouraging women to not acquiesce, to not be seen as commodities. Right, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Stephanie says she's talking about what women are told to wear in Morocco. Mm -hmm. I've experienced it myself when living there, even as a foreigner. Mm -hmm. To me, uh, it was a voice speaking back to those who, right, kind of degrade women. Um, uh, she talks about a friend, yeah, knowing someone who was turning tricks, she said, for this guy that she was with. So, um, and then later on, I, I believe in the song, she says, you know, you, you talk down on her for doing this, but you're actually you're paying for, you're like going to see her yourself. So how can you act religious and talk down on her? I thought that was in the song too, as well. Um, so kind of this whole idea of, and she was saying, yeah, this is what Moroccan women have to go through. Yeah. So, so a total double, like a double standard 
um, that women live with. Okay, here is Justina, whose real name is Farima, at least her first name is Farima, born in Tehran in 1989 and started rapping again in 2008 when she was just 17. Um, and she raps entirely in Persian, although she started out by memorizing English artists, um, specifically US artists Eminem and 50 Cent. Um, and she also, her advent was also, I think, having to do with sort of a competition show. And she started working with a group, a male group, I believe, and then went off solo. Uh, her, her songs deal with social issues or issues that she's dealing with. And she sees rap as a style without limits and borders. So artists can say whatever uh, she wants to say. Um, and that, oh, that was something as well. Sultana said in an interview that she feels like rap is, you know, the way to just like liberate women. You can say anything you want to say, you know, in this, in rap. So that was really interesting to me to know their understanding of rap music. And Justina as well said that, you know, in the U.S. it was like that in the beginning, you know, but maybe people here, us in Iran, we don't know that history because there is a uh, rap in Iran is called rap, rap a Farsi. It's very prevalent since the 90s. Um, but Justine, I think, was kind of making a comment about the current current artists in Iran, uh, rappers. She was just saying they don't always, you know, know those original origins. But she was saying true rap, you know, talks about what's real. You're not going to talk about being a gangster. If, like if you don't, you've never been a gangster. You're going to talk about the issues um, relevant to you. Uh, this is, I'm going to play Kash Dunya Behem Yedukhtar Bede. I wish the world gave me a daughter. She's another one who's, during her interview, mentioned her support from her family, um, particularly her father as well, once they heard what she was doing and um, heard that it was really, you know, she was writing meaningful words, they wanted, they encouraged her to continue. And this video was actually shot in, in Iran um, in secret, privately. Um, what did people think about Justina in this video? Yes. Um, Deb says she loves the line, uh, I want her to know she's not arable land. Yeah, and um, Ross says the daughter that Justina is speaking of seems to be the younger generations. It is almost as though she is passing on that they are their own parsons and not what men or society demands of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. And I also just want to say, Justina, in the videos that I looked at, again, and they were older, um, you can Google her. She's got newer stuff. She doesn't always rap. She's got, you know, she's got a really beautiful singing voice as well. Um, but the videos I looked at that were created as music videos, like she'd always have something, a hood on uh, or hoodie or something. I, I thought that she was always trying to have her own head covered um, or be in disguise. One, another video, she's wearing uh, makeup or white and black makeup on um but today I, I don't know i haven't pulled up if she's still in, in iran or outside doing music but it, i think i she's still producing um yes and a, a certain uh participants feel also that the video brought more meaning right to the words to the lyrics right exactly exactly yeah mm -hmm. like a, as a sense of right wanting something a corrective thing to be done in the future you know that than what she had experienced or her mother had experienced perhaps right mm -hmm. yeah. yes i i appreciated, appreciated the information that at least two of the artists fathers very much supported them i feel like that kind of information could be helpful for students to hear also so just any way to dispel stereotypes about relationships between daughters and fathers in the middle east or in islamic majority countries yeah, exactly. And Malaika too, the Lebanese one, um, her father as well. Um, I think she, her in her case, yeah, she said, again, once they realized what I was writing about, they said, no, this is good, you know, um, this is good to do, like you do this. And right, these are, yeah, I think it's just more really important for us to remember these are people, like <laughs> individual, like people living in these places. Um, and they are contending with the issues of their places, wherever they're at, you know, just like we're contending with 
the stuff going on right now in the US and in our cities and you know and they're they're making art they're they're doing their they're doing what they do within those contexts you know there's no prescription prescriptive uh formula or just behavior that they follow just because they're in that context like mm. they're like human beings like people like all of us you know actually it's a perfect segue to this question um can you name a few American female hip hop artists who would work well for comparative analysis, common themes, differences to among contemporary female artists? Yeah, I really love um, this one, uh, Jamila Woods. She was Chicago based. She had a new album, I think, while I was writing again. So it might have been 2017, 18. There was, I really like some of her songs, uh, reference Chicago, uh, Black Girl Magic. Um, also I like another artist. She was again, more smaller, but maybe she's larger. Her name was Samus, S-A-M-M-U-S. Um, she had some like gaming aspects, video gaming aspects in her, her, uh, work. And she was a PhD student actually at the time, I think at somewhere on the East coast. Sorry. Uh, I saw her perform actually. I think she came here to Champaign. She performed. And so I don't, I haven't followed her closely, but I, she just had really thoughtful lyrics. Um, I like, is it Angel Hayes? There's someone called Angel Hayes. I like her as well. These are people I came across like when I was writing. Um, just really conscious. Uh, yeah, I, there are people that write really thoughtful, um, yeah, thoughtful songs that probably- at the, Thank you, Dr. Williams. Yeah. I, I people in the audience have also volunteered some names sure, megan yeah. stallion or megan t stallion anna tiju's anti-patriarca the city girls so some great suggestions here for one another here is shadia mansoor she is known as the first lady of arab hip-hop I've, I've saved perhaps one of the most prominent uh to last um she was born in london in, in 1985 to a, a christian palestinian family from haifa and nazareth um, and again, this all is from a, an interview I read that she did with a uh, Rolling Stone writer. So her first hit song was Kufia Arabia. The Kufia is Arab, released, released in 2011, and it featured US rapper M1 of the group Dead Prez. And she refers to herself as a Palestinian in exile. So again, as even though she was born in London, she um, exudes Palestinian identity I've uh, all the performances I've seen of her online. I've never seen her perform in person. She's wearing the Palestinian thobe. Um, she's performed in New York and I know, yeah, around Europe as well. Um, I've, I've read too that she would perform in Palestine or go back and, and do workshops and things um, with youth there. And she said as well in this article, she thinks of herself like the Kufiya. She's between two cultures. She's black and white. The Kufi is a, a checkered scarf, um, but she remains true to her origins, her Palestinian origins. And her, I chose not to listen to Kufi Arabia. We could if we had time, but please do, uh, excuse me, look up that song. Um, and you, the lyrics are online. It's a powerful anthem, uh, Palestinian anthem. And again, so, uh such dynamic and brilliant lyrics like just the way she writes and if she raps her style is she's so talented she almost spits like she spits the lyrics almost you know she is she's so good i chose this song somo sur it's a um collaboration she did with anna tiju a chilean uh rapper anna tiju um just because i thought perhaps it might be as useful to you if you're and thinking about um colonialism, uh, imperialism, um, comparative or um, comparative studies, you yeah, have sort of settler issues uh, of dominance that, that happened to a native people um, as we see still um, happening today. Uh, but so I, I liked that. I think they just saw, I, I saw an interview, I think they saw or I'm not sure who asked to, perhaps Anna Tiju 
approached Shadi Mansour. I think that's the way it went um, to get together and do this uh, song. So it's in most of it is in Spanish, but then Shadi comes in with an Arabic verse too. So um, I read that the you know the Palestinian woman has two burdens. She has the burden of her people and of, of being a woman as well, you know. And I think she just carries that uh, so beautifully in her her work and her art. Um, so yeah, I hope that you found some of this useful. You'll continue, you know, teaching as you are. Let me know if you ever use stuff or ever need stuff, or if you ever use something and drop me an email, it would just make my day that, oh, you used a, <laughs> you used a song, you know? So yeah, feel free to be in touch. Okay. All sorts of uh, directions people want to take it to decolonization, language classes. Um, so lots of it, world history, of course. So yeah, lots of, um, Thank yous, thank yous. They loved everything. Thank you guys. Uh, a lot of exclamation. Yes. Thank, uh, thank you once more. Very hearty thanks for joining us today. Special thanks to audience members who participated in previous sessions of how to teach about the Middle East and get it right. Please take advantage of our future offerings of professional development in reputable and relevant content about the Middle East. Happy and safe summer and goodbye for now, everyone.